On today's episode of Angel's Garage, I meticulously go through and rebuild every piece of my Cruzomatic transmission and then completely reassemble this three speed dream, making it look better than the day it rolled out of the factory. And as always, you're invited to come along with me on the Thunderbird Restoration Adventure. Let's go! After disassembling and painting the Cruzomatic in my previous video, I now need to start the hard part of actually rebuilding it. This will include rebuilding the clutch packs, servos, valve bodies, and then carefully putting everything back together. I will also need to take care of the major problems I found during the disassembly, which was the burn up rear clutch drum and the burn up band. And before we dive right into it, there's two things I want to quickly touch on. First, during this rebuild, I'll be following the procedures and torque specifications outlined in my Thunderbirds shop manual. This manual surprisingly has a very good section on rebuilding these Cruzomatics, which should make things much easier. Second, I'm going to be focusing on cleanliness, because one piece of debris is enough to ruin an entire rebuild. So I'll be cleaning all my parts thoroughly with mineral spirits and brake cleaner before they're installed. And with that, we are on our way. Starting out on the case, there's an outer seal for the manual shaft that needs to be replaced. I popped out the old seal with a cotter pen puller, and then put some sealant around my new seal and gently tapped it in with a rubber mallet. Before putting anything else back into the case, I do a final flush with some mineral spirits just to make absolutely sure everything is clean. Then I begin putting things back in the reverse order I took them out. First is the parking paw pen, which I place some lube guard assembly lube onto and then slide back into place. Next up, I pulled out the old O ring inside my manual shaft lever, which is used to seal the kickdown lever and then installed a new O-ring. After lubing up the manual shaft with automatic transmission fluid, I then slide it back into place, making sure the lever arm was facing the front of the case. Quickly following that, I put the manual shaft detent lever and nut back onto the manual shaft and then torqued the nut down. Once torqued down, I put the detent spring and plunger back into place then while carefully holding the detent plunger down, I re-engaged it with the detent lever. I then reattached the arm and clip for the parking pawl back onto the detent lever, and with that done, the manual shaft and parking pawl are now good to go. I then lubed up the kickdown lever with transmission fluid, slide it back through the manual shaft, again with the lever facing towards the front of the case, and then put on the inner lever and nut and torqued it down. The next major assemblies to go back inside the case will be the forward and rear clutch drums. I wanted to go ahead and rebuild the rear clutch drum first so I could take care of this burn up surface. First, I needed to remove the primary sun gear shaft, which is a sun gear controlled by the front clutch drum. I started by pulling off the thrust washers that go between the forward and rear drum. Then I removed two ceiling rings on the front of the shaft, which allowed me to finally slide the sun gear shaft out. As soon as the shaft came out, I noticed multiple small needle bearings beginning to fall out of the drum. All these needle bearings are what the shaft rides on inside the drum, and as you can see, they're just loosely packed inside. Even though these bearings are small and rather annoying, they are very important, so I carefully removed all of them and put them in a small bag so I didn't lose any of them. Time to remove this drum's clutch pack and piston. I started by removing the snap ring on top of the drum, removed the top plate, then I slid out all the frictions and steels that make up the clutch pack. <laughs> 
Just like the outside of the drum, the frictions and steels also displayed burn marks, so it's a good thing I'm replacing them. The final piece to remove is the piston, which is held down with a large spring. To safely remove this spring, it needs to be compressed down so the C-clip and retainer can be removed and then slowly decompressed. An arbor press can be used to compress a spring, but since I didn't have a large enough press, the next best thing is this clutch drum spring compressor from Amazon. And for less than 40 bucks, this tool works great. It had no problems compressing down the spring. With the spring out, the piston could finally be removed. Normally these pistons are held down with a bit of force, requiring compressed air to shoot the piston out, but this piston just practically fell out of the drum, which can only mean one thing. The O-rings on this are completely shot. Yay! Now that the rear drum is disassembled, I could take care of the burnt up, groovy, outside surface of it. Thankfully I work somewhere where I have access to a machine shop, so I put the drum on an engine lathe, and slowly but surely ground down the outside surface of it. After a while, I was left with a much smoother surface. Some of these grooves were way too deep to totally remove, but I did remove all the burn marks and waviness from the surface, so the drum should work just fine. I hope. And with the outside drum surface as good as I can get it, it was time to put the drum back together. I first replaced the O-ring on the piston and the O-ring inside the drum. Both of these O-rings were, well, pretty much petrified. Yeah, rubber shouldn't sound like that. I had to bust both of the old O-rings off with a pick to even remove them. After cleaning and inspecting all my parts, I then put on the new O-rings, lubed them up with transmission fluid, and then slid my piston back into the drum. I then placed a spring and retainer back on top of the piston, compressed them down, and then reinstalled the C-clip. The frictions and steels were up next. I'm replacing the old frictions and steels with some new ones from my rebuild kit, which I got from Concours Parts and Accessories. Before installing the frictions, I soak them in Type F transmission fluid for a while to get them nice and lubricated. Then, starting with a steel, I alternatively stacked up the frictions and steels inside the drum, put the top plate back on, and then put on the snap ring. I then measured the clearance and found that the clearance was pretty large, 93 thousandths of an inch, much larger than the recommended 35 to 50 thousandths of an inch clearance. But I soon realized that was because I was using a different style of friction and steel. To better explain, we're going to need to do a little math. Oh no, not math! Don't worry, this is easy math. Plus, it's for a car, which automatically makes it better. Originally, my clutch pack used dished style steel plates. So if we were to cut one of these plates in half, instead of being flat, they look a little something like this. This means there's a little bit of open space between the steel plate and the friction below it, ten thousandths of an inch to be exact. When compressed, these steel plates are squeezed flat and provide a cushioning effect, making the clutch pack springy. There are originally six steel plates, so that means with ten thousandths of space from each plate, there's about 60 thousandths of an inch total of compression happening when the clutch pack is engaged. Switching over to the new steel plates I got in the rebuild kit, these plates are not only thicker, but they are flat. This means my new clutch pack does not compress. It can't because there's no extra space between the steel plate and the friction. The clutch pack clearance range currently takes into account the extra ten thousandths of space 
that would normally be there from the dished steels. So to accurately measure the non-compressible flat steels, I need to subtract 10 thousandths for each flat steel plate I use. So, since I have 5 new steel plates, I'll subtract 50 thousandths from my original measurement of 93 thousandths, and boom! 43 thousandths. Perfectly in range. Okay, I know that was a bit, but those clearances are important, so I want to spend a little time explaining it. I should also mention that using flat steels does mean the transmission will have a little more of a kick when shifting now, which makes sense because those dished steels aren't there to provide cushioning anymore. But other than that, the flat steels should work totally fine. And with that bit of confusion straightened out, I'm now finished rebuilding the rear drum. The rebuild process was very similar for the front drum, starting off with removing a thrust washer that goes between the drum and the case. I then popped off the snap ring on top of the drum and then pulled off the turbine shaft, aka the input shaft. There's another small thrust washer that stuck to the underside of the input shaft, so I made sure to grab that before I lost it. I then pull out the center hub and then remove the clutch pack, which, like the rear drum, was looking a little worn out. I then remove the snap ring retaining the piston spring, remove the disc spring for the piston, and then slide out the piston. Again, the piston just fell out, so the seals on this guy are also totally shot. Man, this transmission just keeps getting better by the minute! I busted the old seals off the piston and drum with the hammer and pick again, and somehow these seals seemed even more petrified than the last ones. I then cleaned up all the parts, inspected them thoroughly for defects, and then began the rebuild process. I first installed new O-rings on the piston and drum, lubed them up thoroughly with transmission fluid, and then shoved the piston back into the drum. I then put this small ring here back on top of the piston, then set the disc spring on top of the piston. Following that, I installed the first snap ring, which was a little tough going in since this disc spring is putting pressure on it. I then put the pressure plate on top of the disc spring, put the hub in the center, and then stacked up my new frictions and steels. Again, the frictions had been soaked in transmission fluid for a while. Then, using the top plate from the rear drum, I was able to check the clearance for the front drum. After determining that the clearance was acceptable, I removed the rear drum's top plate, stuck the composite thrust washer down with some assembly lube, then installed the input shaft and snap ring back onto the drum. Finally, I put the thrust washer on top of the input shaft, lubed up thoroughly with transmission fluid. The final item to rebuild before these drums go back into the transmission is the primary sun gear shaft. This rebuild was pretty easy compared to the drums. All I had to do was replace the old ceiling rings on the shaft. Once I slid off all the old rings, I then slid on the new ones. There were two rings on the rear of the shaft that had little locking tabs on them, so I made sure to lock the tabs before further assembly. I also left off the two snap rings on the front of the shaft, so it would be easier to install in the rear drum. Now it's time to install the shaft into the rear drum. This process starts by repacking all those loose needle bearings inside the drum. Using assembly lube, which by the way is green lube guard firm tack assembly goo, I carefully packed all the bearings in one by one until they are all back inside. With the needle bearings repacked, I put lube on all the snap rings on the sun gear shaft to facilitate installation into the rear drum, then installed a lubed up thrust washer back onto the primary sun gear, and finally slid the sun gear shaft back through the rear drum. Once the shaft was fully seated down, I installed the two snap rings back on front of the shaft.
I also lube these snap rings up to make installation of the front drum easier. I then put the two thrust washers back on top of the rear drum, again lubed up with transmission fluid, and then began attempting to connect the front drum to the rear drum. The alignment on these has to be perfect, so it took a lot of slow rotations and minor adjustments to get these drums to slide back together, but eventually, I got them to connect. <gasps> now that I got the drum assemblies back together, they're ready to go inside the case. There's just one item that needs to go in the case first, and that is the front band. Since the front band was totally cooked, I needed a new one. New bands were not available for these transmissions though, so the next best thing was to send my old bands to get relined. I found the best place to get bands from was Thunderbird Headquarters. After sending in my old bands as core, I soon received some newly relined bands, looking fresh and ready to see service again. Just like with the frictions, I soaked the bands in Type F transmission fluid for a while, and then squeeze the front band back inside the case. I then ever so carefully installed the drums into the transmission. The next item to go in was a center support, and after getting it in position, I locked it in place with its centering bolts, which are the two bolts on the outside of the case, and a third one in the center of the case, which also holds down the rear servo. I then went ahead and squeezed in the rear band. The next item to go in is the pinion carrier. When I took my rear drum in for repair, I also took the opportunity to polish up the outside of the pinion carrier, which is what the rear band grabs. This just took removing the one-way clutch, or sprag, a small bearing, and then just polishing the surface up with some sandpaper on the lathe. In no time, I had the surface looking as good as new. After cleaning things up, I stuck the bearing down with some assembly lube, reinstalled the sprag, and then slid the pinion carrier back inside the transmission. It took a little bit of twisting to get the planetary gears to engage with the sun gears, but eventually, I got it fully engaged. The last major item to be reinstalled is the output shaft. I slide a lubricated thrust washer onto the back of the pinion carrier, and then slide in the output shaft. The rear pump can now be reinstalled. The outside edge of the pump though was a bit rusty, so before sliding it in, I took the opportunity to remove the rust. I'll touch it up with paint later. Now the pump body was clean, I used some assembly lube and stuck the race and bearing, back inside the body. I then placed a fresh pump gasket on the case, and then I shoved the pump body into the case. Next up, I stuck down the woodruff key with some assembly lube, installed the driving gear, which was lubed up generously with transmission fluid, installed the driven gear, and then reinstalled the pump cover, tightening down all the screws snugly by hand. I then reinstalled the rear pump discharge tube with a fresh O-ring back into the case. The next item to go on would be the governor. The governor has a small valve body on it, and while I'm sure it was fine, I decided to rebuild it anyways just for peace of mind. I disconnected the valve body from the governor body, and then disassembled the valve body which was only a couple of screws and some valve components. I cleaned all the parts thoroughly with mineral spirits, and then I used a flat stone to make sure all the mating surfaces were totally flat. Since none of the valve bodies on this transmission use gaskets, it is critical to make sure all these surfaces are totally flat so they join together perfectly. Once cleaned and flattened, these pieces were ready for reassembly. I checked to make sure the valve was able to move freely, and once I was satisfied, I put everything back together and installed all the screws hand tight.
I then stuck down the lock ball on the output shaft, slid on the governor, gently tapping it with a rubber mallet to seat it down all the way, and then I reinstalled the C-clip. There were some more old ceiling rings on the output shaft that go below the distributor sleeve. I pulled off all the old ceiling rings one at a time, and then I slid on brand new rings. I then lubed up these rings with assembly lube and do my best to center them on the shaft. I then slide on the distributor sleeve. This sleeve is a bit tricky to install because you have to line up the three tubes and slide them into the case while also fighting the sleeve over all the ceiling rings. It takes a little persistence and some taps from the mallet, but I eventually got it installed. Now I put the lock ball back onto the shaft for the speedometer gear, and then slide on a new speedometer gear. The old gear got a little chipped up when I removed it, so I decided to get this brand new 6 tooth speedometer gear off of eBay. This gear is not a shrink fit style gear like the old one, so it slides on much more easily. However, the outer diameter is slightly larger than the old gear, so hopefully it does not cause any problems in the future. Just in case though, I did keep the old gear. I then slide on the C-clip for the speedometer gear. The final piece to go on is the spline seal, and oh my goodness, this piece was harder going on than it was taking off. I could not slide this seal on to save my life, so I had to use a screwdriver to slowly work it down the shaft. Once the seal was back in place, I was now ready for the extension housing to go back on. The extension housing was pretty quick to rebuild. After thoroughly cleaning it out, I installed the governor cover back on, complete with a new gasket. Then I installed a seal back on top of the housing. Originally, the seal on these extension housings had a large boot on it, but the seal that came in my rebuild kit was its flat style seal. It will work, but the boot seal just looked more durable to me. Plus, it was more correct as far as a restoration is concerned, so I got this boot seal from the bird's nest. Also, a 2 and 3 8 inch socket fits perfectly over these seals. Not that you should be smacking sockets with a hammer, but in this case, it sure did make installation easy. With the extension housing complete, I slide a new gasket onto the pump, then slide on the extension housing. I install all the bolts back on, making sure to not forget the brackets for the vent line and vacuum line, and then torque them down. There's only four main components now that need to be rebuilt and reinstalled. First up is the rear servo. The rear servo will be a pretty simple rebuild as it only needs a new o-ring and to be cleaned up. I start by knocking a small pen for the arm shaft out of place. Once out of the way, I can slide the shaft out. And just like with the rear drum, I had a bunch of needle bearings spilling out all over the place, along with two washers. I made sure to keep the bearings in a safe place, and then I moved the servo over to the arbor press. The top piece of the servo is spring-loaded, so I need to keep it locked down while I remove the snap ring. Once the snap ring is off, I can release the pressure and then remove the top piece and the spring. The last item to come out of the servo is the piston, which was locked down pretty good with suction. To remove this piston, I pressurized the bottom of the piston with compressed air, which caused it to shoot out. This, by the way, is how the clutch drum pistons should have behaved had their o-rings actually been in good shape. The final item to come out is the accumulator piston which I released by pressing on the small valve on the bottom of the piston. Now I can thoroughly clean all the parts for the servo and mineral spirits, and then replace the old o-ring on the piston. And with those two simple tasks done, 
I could put the servo back together. I lube up the piston with some transmission fluid and then slide it back into place. I then put the spring and spring retainer back on, compress it in my arbor press, and then reinstall the snap ring. Now's the fun part, putting all those needle bearings back in place. Using some assembly lube, I began packing all the needles back inside the servo arm. I actually found it easier to temporarily slide the shaft back in place while installing the needles, as the shaft helped keep the needle bearings aligned. Once all the needles were in, I stuck the two washers back on the side of the servo arm, and then I slid the servo arm back inside the servo. I got everything lined up to the best of my abilities, then I slid the shaft back in place, and after getting the pen hole lined up, I knocked the pen back inside the shaft. And just like that, this servo is ready to be installed. I first grab the band strut that goes between the band and the adjusting screw in the case and put a generous amount of assembly lube onto it. I then shove the first band strut back into the case. I then grab the second band strut, also covered generously in assembly lube, and stuck it to the servo arm. I then ever so carefully place the servo back into the case, making sure the band strut on the servo engaged with the band. I was then able to thread both of the bolts back into place, and I torqued down the servo. With the rear servo all finished up, now it was time to rebuild the front servo. This process is almost exactly the same as the rear servo, I just need to take it apart and replace all the old O-rings. The servo came apart pretty easily. I removed the snap ring on top, and then the piston assembly and the spring slid right out. The piston assembly needed to be disassembled further to replace all the O-rings, so I removed the screw on top of it, and then it was supposed to slide apart. This dumb thing was stuck together pretty good though, so I had to use a punch and a hammer to carefully beat the pistons apart. With the piston assembly broken down into three main pieces, now I was able to remove all the old O-rings and then clean up all my parts. Now it was time to put this servo back together. I first installed two new O-rings on the outside and inside of the piston retainer, then I installed the O-ring on the main piston, and finally, I installed the O-ring on the return piston. Man, that's a lot of O-rings. I then lubed up all the O-rings and began sliding things back together. The piston and piston retainer went back together with no issues, and then I pushed down the return piston as much as I could. It was being a little stubborn going down all the way, so I used the arbor press to seat it down the rest of the way. Now I install the screw back on top of the return piston, make sure the pistons are able to operate correctly, and then place a spring and piston assembly back inside the servo and install the snap ring. The servo can now be reinstalled in the transmission. I put a lot of assembly lube onto the band strut and then stick it to the servo arm. Carefully, I maneuver the servo back into the case. I have to make sure the band strut grabs the band, which is a bit tricky. I messed up the first time and ended up dropping the band strut into the transmission. One rescue mission later, I reattached the band strut to the servo and then attempted to install it again this time with success. I then go ahead and lightly thread both of the bolts back into the case. I don't want to tighten it down just yet, not until the valve body goes in. Time to rebuild the valve body, which is easily the most complicated piece of this transmission. The overall assembly is referred to as the control valve body, which is made up of four different smaller valve bodies assembled together in layers, kind of like a sandwich 
There are several screws and four bolts that hold this entire assembly together. They come apart like this. First, the cover layer comes off. This layer has some valves which controls the 3-2 shifting or downshifting from third gear to second gear. This layer also connects directly to the front servo via the front servo oil tubes and connects directly to the pressure regulator via the compensator pressure tube. The next layer to come off is the smallest one, the throttle valve body. This valve body is controlled by the vacuum modulator, which uses vacuum pressure from the engine to determine when to downshift the transmission. Below that is what is referred to as the upper valve body. This portion of the valve body is where all the magic happens. The control valve, which is what the shift selector moves, slides back and forth in this valve body to determine which driving mode the car should be in. Next to that is the downshift valve, which is what the kickdown lever controls, which downshifts the transmission when the accelerator is floored allowing the car to speed up faster. Along with those, there's some other valves in this layer to help control fluid pressure. The final layer of this valve body is the lower valve body. This valve body has the 1-2 valve, which controls the first gear to second gear upshift, and the 2-3 valve, which controls the second gear to third gear upshift. This valve body also has some other valves which control things like the rear servo and also connects directly to the pressure regulator via the main control valve tube. Between all the valve body layers are the separator plates, which were all pretty dirty. To start, I go through each layer and disassemble them, first removing the cover plates and then carefully sliding out all the valves and springs. I take my time here and organize everything after I remove them, that way I don't lose or forget anything. Once all the pieces are removed, I then take the aluminum housings and go over them with a flat stone. Just like with the governor, I use the stone to ensure the mating surfaces of these pieces are totally flat and free from dings or burrs, so they are able to join back together perfectly. With that done, I clean the housings and all the other pieces thoroughly in mineral spirits, removing all the years of grime and filth in an instant. With everything clean, I can start putting things back together. I begin sliding all the valves back into place, ensuring they are free to slide back and forth. If not, I hit them with some Scotch-Brite and polish them up until they are able to move freely. After placing all the valves and springs back in place, I then reinstall all the cover plates, tightening them down hand-tight with a screwdriver. And with all the layers reassemble, I start assembling my sandwich of a valve body again first connecting the cover valve body to the lower valve body, using the bolts to help line things up, then connecting the upper valve body to the lower valve body, and finally installing the throttle valve body to the upper valve body. The control valve body assembly is now ready to be installed. I slide the two front servo oil tubes back into the valve body then begin wiggling the valve body into the case. I not only have to get these two tubes to slide into the front servo, but I must also simultaneously engage the manual lever with the manual valve and the kickdown lever with the downshift valve. It takes a little bit, but eventually I get it installed. I was now ready to install the bolts, and I ran to a problem here. The bolts that hold the valve body together were not wanting to slide in, and I soon realized what had happened. The upper and lower valve body layers were misaligned, and sadly to access those screws to realign them, I had to pull the valve body back out. 
Yes, just what I wanted to do. I then pulled the valve body back out and did what I should have done before. As you can see here, these layers are totally misaligned, which is not good. Right now, the valve body is just being held together with its screws, but there are also four bolts that clamp it together. I had used these bolts to align the cover and lower valve bodies, but I have failed to use them while connecting the upper and lower valve bodies together. I loosened up all the screws between the upper and lower layer, then installed the four bolts back into place. With these bolts installed, the valve body layers were now aligned, so I tightened the screws back down. This time I leave the bolts installed, then begin shoving the valve body back into place. Once the valve body was in for good this time, I install the bolts that hold the valve body to the case, then torque down all the valve body bolts and the front servo bolts. The last major component that needs to be rebuilt is the pressure regulator. This piece is very similar to the other valve body layers, so this rebuild goes pretty quick. I first disassemble the regulator assembly, making sure everything is organized so I can put things back together correctly. I then go over the aluminum housings with the flat stone, clean up all the pieces with mineral spirits, and then begin putting things back together. I first slide in the valves, making sure they are free to move, then reinstall the separator plate, this small flapper piece and spring, then the cover piece, and finally tighten down all the screws by hand. At this point, the pressure regulator is ready to go back into the case. Once the two bolts are torqued down, I then slide in the two springs, along with their respective valve stops, and then reinstall the retainer. The inside of the transmission is just about complete now. The last few items to go in are a bunch of tubes. First the lubrication tube, which I gently seat down with a rubber mallet. Then the main control valve tube and the compensator pressure tube, going between the pressure regulator and the valve body. And finally, the rear pump inlet tube, complete with a new O-ring. The very final item to go in the case is the filter, and this time it won't be a cheap piece of felt. I got this original metal style filter from the bird's nest, which should hopefully last a long time to come. The final thing to do before I can cover up this transmission is adjust the front band. This adjustment is relatively simple, but it's critical to get it right because a misadjusted band can lead to problems and damage in the future. To adjust this band, I first loosen up the lock nut for the screw, then set a quarter inch spacer between the screw and the servo. In this case, I use multiple shims on a feeler gauge, which add up to a quarter inch. I then tighten down the screw to approximately 10 inch pounds, or enough to take all the slack out of the servo. Then I remove the feeler gauge and turn the screw in one additional turn. Then, while holding the screw in place, I tighten the lock nut down and then torqued it. And with that, the front band should be ready to go. Now that everything inside the case is complete, I lay down a new quart gasket and then install the oil pan. Then I reinstall all the bolts and tighten them down nice and tight by hand. The transmission can now be flipped over and the final few items can be added. Next up is the front pump. This pump was pretty easy to rebuild. All I really needed to do was replace a front seal. I replaced this seal by knocking out the old one with a hammer and punch, and after cleaning up the housing, I then grabbed my new seal, put some sealant around it, then set up the pump in my arbor press. After pressing my new seal into place, I lubed up the driving and driven gears with transmission fluid, placed them back into the pump body, then reattached my stator support, 
to the pump body. Once everything was together, I confirmed that the gears were free to move by spinning them around with a pick. With my freshly rebuilt pump ready to go, I put a new O-ring on the case, then slide on the pump. I then install the four bolts and torque them down. The next item to go on was my brand new vacuum modulator. I first slide the push rod back into the hole, then put a new gasket on the vacuum modulator, screw it back into the case, then tighten it down with a wrench. Right behind that is the speedometer gear. I'm missing some of the parts for this system, so I'll need to work on it later, but for now, I quickly took things apart, cleaned up everything, replaced the O-ring, then slid the gear back into the extension housing. Before moving on, I decided to go ahead and torque down the two bolts for my center support, and then adjust my rear band. Just like with the front band, the rear band has a very specific way to adjust it. This started with loosening the lock nut, and then tightening the band adjustment screw down to 120 inch pounds. Once the screw had been torqued down, I turned it back out exactly one and a half turns, and then, while holding the screw in place, tightened down the lock nut. Once I had seated the lock nut down, I then torqued down the nut. The nice thing about this band adjustment is that it can easily be adjusted later via the access hole in the car, which allows access to the screw without having to remove the transmission from the car. There are very few things left to do on this transmission now. I now add some of the finer details. First the data plate for the transmission, and then the vent line. Both of them recoded with Seymour Lumablast, which makes these small parts look great. Now it was time for the bell housing to go back on. I installed and tightened down the four bolts that retain it, and then it was back to the very first part I removed, the dipstick tube. I'll probably need to pull this off later when it's time to install the transmission into the car, but for now, I decided to go ahead and screw it back on. The very final piece to go back on is a freshly refurbished torque converter. These torque converters can be a little tricky to find because you can't buy them online. I bought this torque converter a while ago from Mitchell Transmission Supply in Jacksonville, Florida, which has them for an excellent price. The last thing to do now was touch-up paint. I applied some black paint to the exposed section of the rear pump body I had cleaned up before, and then touched up some of the bolts that I had nicked the paint on. And with that, this transmission was complete. I won't know for a while how well this transmission works because the car is missing a couple of pieces, like the engine, rear end, gas tank, okay well everything basically. But if this transmission works as good as it looks, then I should be in great shape. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope you all found this video informative and entertaining, and I will see you all next time.